So I'm, I'm from Barts. Barts was the, we were the first prime site for, for quintiles as you, there, as you then were. Uh, and uh, Dennis Gillings and Mark Caulfield, my boss, had a vision of, of you're bringing all the trials that you brought to the UK to our center uh, and to see if Barts could run them and do them. Uh, and that's a, the prime site concept has, has gone worldwide. Um, so this is, the team, this is the team back at HQ. Manish Saxena, my colleague in the middle of the team there, who actually tends to do the, the bulk of the IQVIA related work, uh, my colleague, um, and our team that's from uh, 14 different countries uh, dealing with studies from, although cardiovascular disease and hypertension and lipid lowering were our core expertise, we now do studies in diabetes, dementia prevention, uh, COPD, asthma, all manner of things. Um, and uh, so uh, and we're, we're, we're standing in front of the, 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 the wall which Quintiles uh, IQVIA helped to fund, uh, which talks about William Harvey, who was the most famous son of Bart's, who uh, was obviously the first person to discover that the heart didn't make the blood fresh for each heartbeat, um, that there was a circulation. So there's no pressure when we get to work. I actually switch the lights on behind William Harvey in the morning and realize I have quite a lot to live up to. Um, now I'm going to in introduce uh, some of our patients to you uh, because however clever the stuff that we get to do with them, clinical trials, I tend to find that the patients always go one better than we do and always find something more amazing than we do. The um, tri Trials Connect is a group of patients, myself, there's some, some other, others here, who are, have been on a clinical trial or still are on clinical trials and are offering our professional or life skills or our experience to help the work of the centre and the publicity about the centre and so on. Um, and we do that really by telling our stories and that's what's going to happen later on today and that we're part of something bigger, Powerhouse UK. We have put in place structures so that patients who finish studies with us, we're particularly interested in post-study patient training. You saw some of the patients getting uh, resuscitation training from Bart City Lifesaver in our waiting area. Um, and we're very keen to offer patients opportunities to help us at the end of their studies. Uh, because oddly, saying goodbye is not the easiest part of a five-year clinical trial. Um, so patients, uh, and uh, Ron may explain his experience of working with us uh, later on. Right, now unfortunately Glenn sent his apologies. His guttering was shot and he couldn't join us today. Glenn, was, Glenn joined us 20 years ago for a trial called ASCOT, which was a 19,000 patient cardiovascular outcome trial um, that helped to change the blood pressure and cholesterol guidance for the UK. Uh, and he's on a, a study which unfortunately has nothing to do with uh, IQVIA, but with a study with uh, to gliflozin. Um, and he was going to describe how much better his blood sugar has been since he's been on and uh, what we suspect might be an IMP as part of a clinical trial. Uh, so we apologise for Glenn's gutters. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, what, what time of year do you think the slide was? Um, that's actually a British summer, I'm afraid. It wasn't the last summer, so everybody's wearing clothes, but that, everybody's wearing winter clothes, but that was the... Uh, that was the strawberry tea at the end of Ascot when 500 or 600 of the patients were in the marquee to hear some of the results. So now, unfortunately, not all of the trials uh, result in glory and success, like atorvastatin preventing a third of heart attacks in Ascot. Some trials are a bit more negative. Paul, can you explain why your study wasn't so positive? Um, I was on a study called Illuminate, um, looking to do good things for my, my cholesterol. Up on the slide there, you'll see the cover of a textbook I helped write and uh, an A-level syllabus I helped write, which includes work on clinical trials. Um, and I was able to put this experience into an exam question a couple of years later. But um, because I was involved in that sort of work, I was on um, various email lists. And so one Friday evening, um, from an American list, um, a, I got an email uh, released after the close of the stock market in New York to say that the Illuminate study had been stopped um, because patients were dying, basically, um, or it certainly wasn't doing any good. 
And so I knew that on the Friday night. So it wasn't too surprising when early the next week we began, uh, I got a message and other patients, um, we began to get messages, come into the clinic. Um, you might have seen some articles in, I think it was in the Mail on Sunday in particular, but certainly in the Sunday newspapers. And first thing Monday morning, um, uh, well, the Illuminate study was Pfizer. The, their share price had just gone through the floor the following uh, the Monday morning as a result of this study. So a few, um, a few weeks later, or maybe a month or two later, um, David called all the patients to together to a meeting and went through the results slides and the reasons that the study had been stopped. And it was out of some discussion really after that that a number of us got together and said, well, um, we, might do, we might do something to help here. And hence we're on the stage. So it's a bit surprising. Obviously, torcetropin, which was the active drug for Illuminate, raises good cholesterol. So we were trying to increase the benefit we get from statins in people who are at very high risk of a heart attack. But unfortunately, torcetropin also increased blood pressure. Paul's, Paul's publicly talked about his own blood pressure going up and us stopping the IMP while it was still blinded uh, before the study stopped. Um, but the drug was killing people. Um, it happened to be people in the States in, in this case, but um, the surprising thing for us was A, how nice the patients were about it. Nobody blamed us. A few patients were a bit grumpy that they found about it in the Times or the Daily Mail on Monday morning, and we didn't get to them until later that morning to ring them to stop their torcetropin. But the patients were incredibly nice about it. And weirdly, the patients from the Illuminate study have been some of our most loyal patients, and they've done much earlier phase studies subsequently. So rather than pinning me against the wall and hurling rocks at me, which I would have thought wasn't unreasonable for on paper at least trying to kill them, the patients seem to make a wonderfully clear distinction between the test of the drug and our ability to carry out a fair test. So, in fact, in, the, in this building, there's a bit of a story about Colin Brown, who apologises he can't be here. Uh, but Colin uh, was, a, was a, a patient on a, what turned out to be a neutral study with the next drug uh, like uh, torcetropib called dalcetropib that also increased good cholesterol. Over four years, it didn't improve events at all. It was absolutely neutral. Uh, the Kaplan-Meier curves were completely uh, indistinguishable from placebo. But Colin was pleased when Dennis Gillings came to open our unit at Bart's um, and asked to shake Dennis Gillings' hand up on the slide um, because, as he rather cogently put it, without you, I, without you bringing the study to Bart's, I'd be dead. Um, and uh, he explained how, uh, as a part of a routine examination, we'd found his abdominal aortic aneurysm that's on the slide, which was enormous. And when we, when we took him over to the Royal London in a taxi to be uh, seen by the surgeons, uh, they explained, they explained to him he, he didn't have time to have a stent made, it had to be an open operation. Uh, but Colin, came, Colin was videoed, um, and when Dennis did the opening of this magnificent building, which I probably shouldn't mention today of all days, um, I'm told there were a thousand people, including Dame Sally Davis, the Chief Medical Officer of Health here, um, and uh, Dennis interrupted the, the videos and said, look, that's why I set up the company, to do stuff like we did for Colin. Um, now, we thought that was clever when we told Colin, look, my, our boss got to stand and take a round of applause in front of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, the boss of the NHS. Isn't that good, Colin? Colin said, that's not bad. He said, but, but since that time, we've opened, because I, I work for Refuge, he, one of the co-founders of Refuge, the women's, battered women's charity. He said, since I didn't die of my aneurysm, we've opened another seven uh, refuges for battered women. I asked him yesterday and he said it's now 20 refuges they've opened since he didn't die of his aneurysm. Uh, so Colin made his point rather well. So Mary, the, um, you're helping with the clear outcomes study. Um, you also helped with the SPIRE study first. Can you describe what we were doing to you for SPIRE? Yeah, um, it was uh, something to do with cholesterol, keeping cholesterol down for people who can't um, Manage statins, and it was by injection. I had to give, you had to give, uh, to give myself once a fortnight, I think it was, uh, an injection. Um, fortunately for me, but unfortunately for the study, I had I used to get a little slight reaction when I 
withdrew the needle. And I deduced from that that I was not on the placebo. And when I tried to tell the people in the study about this, they didn't want to know. They were doing la, la, la. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't want to know about it. Um, but the, the, uh, that went on for about, I think the study was about a year um, or so. And then it was prematurely stopped uh, because somebody else bought out something. The, the Pfizer drug worked, but it didn't work well enough. The effect wore, wore off and Pfizer abandoned its development. Uh, other drugs were successful. But you're on the clear outcome study now. Yes. Uh, well, I said the first, the reason why I came on the studies was, first of all, out of curiosity. And then the second thing, I'd like to be useful, because since my health incident stopped me working, um, just look for, <laughs> looking for things to be useful at. And uh, I thought this was a good way of giving back something because they do look after us when we're on the program. They want to make sure, if they can, that we last till the end of the, <laughs> of the trial. But it works both ways and that's very, very welcome. And it's one of the big pluses, um, as well as them being nice people to deal with. Yeah, it's one of the best things about being on the trial. And, uh, Hmm. Clear, clear Outcomes is, is an IQVIA study, and the benpidoic acid, which is potentially good for people who can't take statins, was produced chemically by the same folk that came up with the torvastatin. So we're very hopeful for that. Thank you, Mary. So, Lucas. Lucas, when we first met, I think, do you remember how you got to see us? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I, I obviously collapsed, and, and I obviously got dedicated to this, to William Harvey, and um, I was told my, I look like a Ferrari with a Fiat Panda engine, <laughs> so, and I, it's still that way now. But, can, um, can we unpack, can we unpack that a bit? Um, when you, I think your GP wrote to you, and I think possibly because you'd smoked in the past, you got the letter through the post, and what was it you didn't understand when we first had a chat? I didn't understand how serious my, my condition was and, and what state my, my lungs was in, really. Mm -hmm. you would have, I mean, you know, you're a very fit-looking man. And, and, very and the, fit. The slightly, <laughs> the slightly, the, the, yeah, the slightly worrying thing was that I, I, I was really horrified when you reminded me that I described you as being a Ferrari with a Fiat Panda engine because that's one of those comments that comes back to haunt you. But you later said that it was actually helpful in some way. It was very helpful. It just made me understand that, that it's not always how you look, it's how you feel. Um, and because you then went on to help us with more than one trial. So you, yes, I'm on my third trial now. So L Lucas, for his COPD, went on to... You did a complicated study with a body box looking at blood vessel stiffness and things for GSK. That's correct. And you're now on the Pearl study. Yes, on the Pearl study, and I've, my health has improved on that very much in the past eight months. The fancy thing about the Pearl study is an exciting drug delivery system, which is essentially big fatty particles with, with holes in, which help the drug to get further into the lung. So at the moment, all, none of our patients are on placebo, and, and like Lucas, they all feel better, which is really rewarding. It's great. No, thank you. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, uh, can you pass it along to the end? So, Leslie, uh, can you describe what we're looking at on the screen? Uh, this is what I masquerade as doing for a living. Um, I used to do it a big time. I'm now a director of the company that does it. We do work for um, internationally known companies. And someone else mentioned green. I think it was Annabelle earlier mentioned green things. This is part of a river water project where I mentioned the name British Telecom. They've got a, a large building on the banks of the River Thames. And what we do through very large diameter pipes, we suck water off of the river and we use it for cooling all our refrigeration plant and all our computers and everything else. And then we throw it back in the river. And for that benefit, we give Thames Water a couple of thousand pounds a year, which they're happy with. But imagine the amount of energy it saves 
over the course of a year to, as, as to doing it and putting it over cooling towers and everything else. So that's just one project uh, that involved. I'm still working. I'm nearly 74 now. They won't let me go. The children beat me up if I say I'm not coming to work. So uh, that's where we are. So, Le Leslie, how did you get to be with us? To get on to the Radiance project, I've suffered with high blood pressure for approximately the last 20 years. I never got to grips with it, really. <laughs> and then I read an article by these gentlemen in the, uh, in the Daily Mail of all problem, uh, pages, uh, starting this project um, where they put you on a new drug and then it culminates with a, a minor procedure uh, to denerve some bits and pieces. I don't know the whole details of it. And uh, yeah, it went from there. And it's been, some of it's been very successful, uh, some I'm still waiting to do. So, in, so Leslie, you, you, Leslie's helped us with, a, with helping us with a study called Radius, Radiance HTN, which is a study for people whose blood pressure isn't, con, isn't controllable by conventional means. And in the run-in for the study, he went on a powerful triple combo pill that has three drugs in one tablet. Uh, which works really well, but wasn't enough to control his blood pressure. And we were lining him up to have a thing called renal sympathetic nerve denervation, which essentially means putting wires in the groin and then feeding a wire up inside the artery to the kidney and uh, with ultrasound energy, applying donuts of energy to damage the nerves that uh, travel to and from the kidney and which are partly responsible for high blood pressure. Um, but Something unusual happened to Leslie while we were working him up for that because my, Dr. Saxena, and my colleague, had organized for his kidney scans because we can only zap the nerves to the kidneys if we know your kidney arteries are roughly the right size and in the right place uh, without any funny blockages. Um, but you got a phone call from Manish because uh, he wasn't thrilled with your scan, Leslie. They normally they tell you you get a result of your scan within one to two weeks. Uh, I was fortunate, I got a call in two days, or less than two days, saying, can you come in tomorrow? <laughs> and you think, hmm. Um, so I went in and it was the, uh, I don't know if anyone's experienced it, but the little room on the side where, you, yeah, can you come into this room? I've got a little bit of bad news for you. And the complementary CT scan had found a, uh, a renal mass on one of my kidneys, which on face value it could have been carcinogenic, carcinoma, call it whatever you like, cancer to me. Um, the team were excellent, really well done. They got me an appointment at the Royal Free and I had a, a renogram and a, a biopsy and someone was smiling because it turned out to be benign and uh, come back in six months and we'll see if there's any changes. Uh, in the meantime, I've asked if I can go back on the trial because I enjoyed it so much. <laughs> and, and it's a hard thing sometimes to explain, and Leslie's put it better than I can, that sometimes you know, we've all heard of collateral damage, but in clinical trials actually more frequently so we see collateral benefit. And often people get benefit from not being part of the trial. And although in a sense that's a kind of... Um, you know, that can be seen as a kind of CRO disaster because the patient doesn't actually randomise and isn't part of the positive metrics. On the other hand, understandably, Leslie isn't complaining that when his renal mass was investigated that we, and he, he saw the expression on our faces, we thought was renal cell carcinoma, turn out to be benign and not, not worrying. Um, and he could see the faces at the Royal Free when they got the biopsy result as well. Um, people don't complain if they get benefit that's nothing to do with the randomised treatment or if they don't get randomized. Uh, so Ron, um, can you tell us, a, a, well, the Cantos study, which Ron's been part of, was unusually dangerous because it used an antibody drug called canakinumab to block interleukin-1 beta, which is very central to the inflammatory pathway. And some of my professorial colleagues at Bart's thought that it was, that this would be a bad news for patients. But we did warn you that it might be bad news. Ron, in what way did we warn you? The what most impressed me when I first um, um, joined the study was the full information that I got, um, not only from the documentation that was provided to me beforehand, but also when I came up and had a chat and it happened to be with uh, a very friendly gentleman called David. And, skip, um, skip the commercial, I'll keep going. <laughs> I, I told you I'd embarrass you today, David, but um, the, 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 that's what most impressed me. 
and he didn't uh, skip over any of the dangers or, no, dangers is the wrong word, any of the risks associated with it. So th the main risk we described is, is that we might give you infections with this drug because we were reducing oh, yes. your immunity. Yes, it could affect the immune. It could affect the immune um, system, and uh, we we had to be careful about reporting any infection or um, um, any problems that we had health-wise um, uh, on regular visits to the to the clinic, and um, the. Um, and this this worked very well, I think. And um, can you can you describe why you were suitable for the trial? Yes, I can. Um, the uh, you, you, you probably already know this, but there are inclusion and exclusion clauses. One of the preconditions of joining the study was having had a heart attack. And I think that had to be documented, and I fitted that criteria. Um, one of the others was that the inflammatory markers in my blood um, had to be within certain levels, and a blood test was taken, and I fell within that category. The exclusion um, category can say loads of things, one of them being pregnant, so, and, and, that, didn't, and that didn't apply. <laughs> Ron used to be a solicitor's clerk, so he could probably recite the list of exclusion criteria <laughs> if I'm not careful. Um, so, but partway through the trial, while we were still running, we were still running double blind, um, there was consternation amongst my fellow investigators because a, a, a message came back from Paul Ridker, the professor of medicine in Harvard, who's the chief investigator for the study, um, uh, with, with a number of instructions. One was to say that the Data Safety Monitoring Board had said it's okay to carry on with the trial. Um, there are more infections, some of which are very serious, as we expected, um, but there's a balancing benefit uh, that some of the patients don't seem to be getting cancer. So we think it's okay to go on, um, but there was no direct instruction about what to tell the patients, and my fellow investigators were up in arms about, you know, what do you expect us to do and things. So Ron volunteers on a Friday morning on the front desk in the Heart Centre, and he's always there, um, charming people, as he does. And... Um, and I mentioned this to, to Ron, and uh, what did you say? My reaction was, I said to David, don't worry, that's the um, um, me uh, professor of medicine at Har Harvard uh, University covering his arse. <laughs> ap ap apologies. <laughs> so that's probably as memorable as the thing I said to, to Lucas. So, but as luck would have it, uh, because as luck would have it, a few weeks later, we were sitting in a, in a hotel at Heathrow, with the, with the European and, and Eastern Europe investigators meeting, discussing exactly the thing that Ron's been talking about. And in the breakout meeting for the UK, uh, with 120 of us there, Paul Ridker, oh, there was no US meeting, so Prof came into, Paul came into the meeting. And partway through the meeting, which was a bit dull, I said, oh, Paul, one of our patients asked about seeing your letter. And, uh, and, uh, and his comment was, oh, that's just the professor of medicine from Harvard covering his arse. Um, the, the room did go a bit quiet. Uh, the, the, the chairman helpfully translated arse into ass because he thought that was more American. Paul, whilst keeping cryptically quiet for a moment, uh, said that he did understand uh, and rather stunned the audience by pointing out that that was exactly what he meant. That other chief investigators in his position had been criticised for not being transparent about what the DSMB advice was. So Ron, uh, who's, uh, why could you not go to the, to the meeting in Basel recently with, uh, with Novartis? I've never been abroad. And he never had a, he doesn't have a passport. I, I didn't have a passport. So Ron, without even having a passport, managed to get into the head of the professor of medicine in Harvard, thousands of miles away, more accurately than my fellow investigate PIs uh, in the UK, uh, which I thought was quite impressive. Uh, we need to move on. Yep. Da David, may I just say a thank you to everyone here as a patient, because if it hadn't been for... You may not realise it, but all the work that you do affects people like me, a patient, and you've helped thousands upon thousands of people like me by doing the work that you do and enabling your company to help support, um, well, help support, help support us. So thank you very much. I hope you don't mind. 
Which brings us to, um, to one of today's unmentionable topics. We can't mention buildings and we can't mention Brexit. <laughs> Weirdly, Margot Horsepool on the video um, is one of the UK's top experts on Brexit. She's a professor of European law and one of our ex-patients. Uh, weirdly speaking from France yesterday, her, her take on it, and she does know a lot of the 580 pages because she interprets for European heads of state all the time, is that she said it's probably, and she was born in Holland, survived the Hague famine, weirdly went to the States, then came back and was trained by Hitler's interpreter after he survived giving evidence at Nuremberg uh, and became one of the top uh, in, uh, interpreters for heads of state, from Mer Cole to Merkel, Blair, Brown, May, you name it. Um, I, her take on it is that Brexit's probably the best deal we were going to get, but I, I shouldn't mention Brexit. That was only Margot's opinion this, yesterday. Uh, can you run the tape? But better to hear from Margot directly. Uh, well, from the beginning, it's, it's, it's really been a, a very positive experience. And, I mean, I positively like coming here. It's quite convenient to me. Um, uh, even making appointments and say, well, please, can you not let, make, make me travel in the rush hour? So, uh, and I say after 10 o'clock, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, generally, the treatment is very personal when you get here. Um, you, you get um, looked after very well. If you come without breakfast, uh, they supply it to you here. Um, and, um, and from really, the, the, there's very little sense of hierarchy here. Um, you, uh, you really feel they are a team um, and, you know, very, very uh, cohesive team as well. So, you know, I've met several people, obviously, and didn't always know who did what. Um, but that didn't matter. Um, and uh, nobody's too high or too low to get you a cup of coffee or uh, any, anything like that. And, and um, you, you know, you, so it, it's all made incredibly easy for you. That's the other interesting thing I found in these trials, that there seems no sort of class-based um, difference in, in who participates. It's it, it literally, well, obviously it's a lot of locals, but it, it's the local situation here, itself here is, is very varied. Uh, and you literally meet people from all work, walks of life, from top to bottom. So that is, you know, just interesting in itself, I think. So I don't think she'd mind me mentioning it, but when Brexit happened and the original announcement was made, Margot came in and she was worried about one of our nurses, uh, Anya, who's uh, Polish. I think she'll just about forgive me for mentioning it because her husband is Scottish. And Margot came in and spontaneously said, I'm worried about your staff and what on earth they're going to think about all of this. I want to do a talk for them. Uh, so I said, that's brilliant, because you know, we're from 12 countries, it does affect us, but there's 480 staff in our institute from, from 48 countries, would you do it in our big lecture theatre? So Margot blithely says yes, uh, and the next week at the time when our principal was saying no comment to every question about Brexit and its implications, Margot came and gave a 40-minute reviewer a talk on the implications of Brexit, what was possible, what wasn't, and what staff should do to try and secure their own status. And she brought a friend who she just described as a friend when she came, who typical Margot turned out to be the head of law at Reading um, and who was their professor of international law. So we had two world-class opinions uh, for our staff. <laughs> And when we tried to say to ask Margot afterwards, blimey, that was an amazing thing you did for us. And she said, well, she thought she, she's offered because she wanted to, uh, because she want, it was a spontaneous offer. It was something she did and she could. And probably it was just because she got a cup of tea when she came to the clinic and people treated her as an individual because actually she had done other clinical trials, but previously hadn't even done as much as an extra questionnaire or an extra blood sample. So she realized it was out of character to do that. So we think that's the benefit of, of, of trials generally and being nice to patients generally. Uh, and Margot's quite inspirational. So we think that working with patients, we're enthusiasts for post-study training, making sure patients know the impact of what they've achieved and how they've changed things uh, and how impactful they can be even beyond the trials they've done. Um, so if, it, if, Paul, if Paul gets the graphic going, which he obviously is, um, that we, we think that it's a way of, of both helping the difficult things of the trial, recruitment at the front end, and dissemination and impact of trials at the end. If I, if I go to a meeting abroad about a new drug or a new treatment we've developed and been involved in, I, I know that not only will people want to know about what NICE says about it, however much we moan about them, it's, it's influential all over the world, but also if our patients talk about it with us or in the media, 
Um, the first person story always trumps anything. Oh God, I can't use that word anymore. Um, it is always more useful, impactful than, than what we say. Um, and we think that's part of a process that can be harnessed and can be useful. Um, so, and I, I hope we've made some of those points, but I suspect from Paul's expression we've overrun, and I must apologize for that. Um, but I'd like to thank the patients uh, who came with us today and all the team back at Bart's who weren't able to be, Manish and my colleagues, um, and our team that came, and Paul for trying to keep me in order. And obviously, I, I queue via Quintiles as was for bringing us the prime site, um, which has been a, a great concept, uh, and we've been very grateful for. So thank you.